Hi everyone, let's continue our discussion of the Sommerfeld expansion. At the end of the last mini lecture, we showed that integrals of functions h over the Fermi Dirac distribution can be expressed in the following way. plus higher order terms. This is the Sommerfeld expansion. And if you remember, our program is to calculate the specific heat of free electrons in the Sommerfeld model. And in, uh, uh, to do this, we need to compute the total energy uh, and we need to compute the density to make sure that the Fermi Dirac distribution and the chemical potential are properly normalized. So let's continue on with, um, with this program. So remember, first we need to compute the total energy. Which is this subject to the requirement that the density is equal to this integral. So now we're going to use uh, the Sommerfeld expansion here uh, to uh, to simplify these integrals. So we'll start first with the total energy and then we'll write down the integral for the density. So the integral for the energy, I'm gonna call it one. The first order term is the integral from zero uh, to mu of now h times dE, but h in the case of u is g times e. Remember the density of states is zero for negative energies, so I'm free to change the limits from minus infinity to zero. Now let me include uh, the first, the next term in the Sommerfeld expansion. So now we have to compute h prime at mu. Again, h is g times e, so it looks like this. All right. Now our equation for the density looks like this. And in this case, H prime of mu is just G prime of mu. So the second equation, as we've said before, the equation for the density will determine what mu is. Uh, it will fix the value of mu. Uh, it also tells us that uh, already you can see that mu will differ from uh, the Fermi energy by terms of order t squared. So you can see the correction is of order t squared here. Uh, again, the, the zero temperature uh, term is just this here. That's all there were, uh, we would have uh, mu is equal to the Fermi energy EF, um, but you can see that we're going to get terms of order T squared um, as, as a correction. So using this knowledge, which again is that mu will differ from the Fermi energy by terms uh, of order T squared, we can say the following thing. The first term, the integral of, of h from zero to mu uh, to order t squared can be written as the integral from zero to the Fermi energy of h plus uh, now the first order correction to this. Again, I feel like we've Taylor expanded uh, this um, uh, we've Taylor expanded this expression here. Here is the, the first order correction to it. Um, if we're working to order T squared, we know that mu differs from the Fermi energy EF by terms of order uh, T squared. So this expression over here is indeed correct to terms, uh, to, to order T squared, uh, which is 
our, our desired accuracy in this computation um, in the first place. So what we're going to do is we're going to apply this simplification um, to the integrals we, we wrote down before. Remember the first term is, is exactly something like this in the expressions for the total energy and density. Uh, we're going to make this simplification, which is again correct to order t squared. Then for the other terms that are already uh, of order t squared, uh, we're simply going to replace um, uh, mu, the chemical potential, by the Fermi energy uh, in, in, in those terms. So our expression for the internal energy becomes, now I'm going to apply this simplification that I've written down on this slide. Now, here are some other terms. So this piece here and this piece uh, here result from my use of this simplification here for the first term in this expression. Uh, the last terms here and here are the next order terms in the Summerfield expansion. You notice that I've replaced um, the chemical potential by the Fermi energy because these terms are already of order t squared. Um, so again, this expression is now correct to order uh, t squared. Let's continue with our expression for the density. Again, we'll make similar simplifications here. All right, so we've now made considerable progress in our computation of the specific heat, although it might not seem like it at this stage. Um, one thing to note here is that the temperature independent terms, the very first terms in each of these expressions are the ground state values. Uh, the next set of values are the, uh, the corrections when we allow T to be uh, non-zero. Um, now, uh, we can make a very important simplification here by noting uh, the following fact. The density is temperature independent by assumption. We have assumed in this uh, Sommerfeld model that the density of electrons is given, it's fixed, it cannot change with temperature. That means that this term in the braces here must be equal to zero. This is now a key step in this process. So let us set zero is equal to the term in the braces. We can rearrange this equation uh, to find an expression from mu. Uh, so this now is an expression from mu, and we see that it differs from the Fermi energy by terms uh, of order t squared. Uh, this is again, in accordance with our expectation and uh, how we constructed uh, the derivation in, in the first place. Um, we can substitute our uh, earlier result uh, for the density of states. We can substitute in the explicit value of that, uh, and we can simplify the expression from mu even further. So we find that it's equal to the Fermi energy times one minus a third of pi kBT over twice the Fermi energy squared. Um, already, you can see that the correction 
to the chemical potential with temperature is rather small, again, because typically uh, we expect that Fermi energies are of order 10 to the 4 Kelvin, and for temperatures uh, of order room temperature, uh, this, this factor in parentheses will be of order 10 to the minus 4. Um, so this is how we fixed the chemical potential, uh, and at the same time allowed the temperature to be non-zero. Uh, we can go back to our expression for the, the total energy. So uh, I'll, I'll use one to indicate the equation for the internal energy. Um, perhaps I'll just write it down here to refresh your memory. So we had U is equal to this sum. Um, this piece over here is the ground state contribution. I omitted the term in braces here uh, because it's exactly the term that we set to zero uh, by requiring that the density not depend on temperature. So this will vanish. Uh, we're left with the following. The total internal energy is equal to u naught, the ground state part, plus pi squared over six kBT squared times the density of states at the Fermi energy. So now we're finally in a position to compute the specific heat, which is du dt, constant volume. Just uh, taking the derivative of our expression for u, we find that the specific heat is pi squared on three kB squared t g e f. Uh, remember that we are enforcing the proper normalization of the Fermi direct distribution um, with our expression for the chemical potential, which is the thing that guaranteed that the term in the braces for the total energy uh, vanished. Okay, here's our expression for the specific heat. Uh, we can simplify this a bit further by, again, substituting our expression for the density of states at the Fermi energy. This is pi squared on two kBT over EF times N kB. Now let's remember our result for the specific heat in the Druda model using Maxwell-Boltzmann statistics. Using an argument based on equal partition, we found that the, the specific heat in this framework should be 3 halves nKB. Uh, you can see that the, the Sommerfeld result is smaller by a factor of pi squared on 3 kBT over EF. Again, EF is of order 10 to the 4 Kelvin. Uh, at room temperature, this is uh, roughly about 1 one hundredth. Um, so this is a, a hallmark of uh, the Sommerfeld model, this calculation for the specific heat. Uh, in particular, uh, the Sommerfeld model predicts that the specific heat should vary linearly with uh, the temperature T. This is in uh, direct contrast to um, the classical model, which predicts a temperature independent specific heat. Um, and indeed, this is uh, actually measured in some materials. Often, uh, it's the case that measured specific heats uh, have a term that varies linearly with temperature plus a term that varies uh, as T cubed. Um, and um, if the temperature is low enough that this term uh, has a vanishing contribution, indeed the linear T specific heat uh, is revealed. Uh, as we'll see later in the course, the, the cubic uh, temperature dependent specific heat component comes from mechanical vibrations or phonons in, uh, in the lattice. Um, so um, uh, 
this is this is good. This is very good news. Uh, for one, it seems like we're, we're making progress uh, with creating a theory that matches um, that, that matches the experimental data. So let's finally address uh, conduction in the Sommerfeld model. Um, if we're thinking about things like the mean free path, uh, we should compute it in the Sommerfeld model as the product of the Fermi velocity times the re relaxation time tau. In contrast to the classical approach, uh, where we got a value of order angstroms, now uh, we'll get a result of order 100 angstroms or so. Um, still, it is the case that the conductivity sigma is n e squared tau over m. Uh, nothing about the Sommerfeld model changes that. Indeed, we still don't have a good theory for why this relaxation time tau comes about uh, in, in the first place. Um, when we think about the thermal conductivity, our earlier Duda result is still true. Kappa is a third v squared tau cv. Um, last time when we looked at the thermal conductivity, we considered equipartition to derive v squared and cv. Now we know that that's not true. We should use um, the Fermi velocity squared or v squared and our, um, our, our, our recent calculation of, uh, of, of cv. Um, um, so if, if we now uh, substitute in all of these values and if we uh, compute the Wiedemann-Franz law again, kappa over sigma times uh, t, again, see this is a third vf squared tau uh, and our expression for uh, for CV, which is pi squared on two KBT over EF and KB. And if we divide this through by N V squared tau over M, we'll find that we have pi squared on three, kb over e squared. Uh, compare this to the classical result, which was three halves kb over e squared. Uh, so you see that these two calculations are uh, remarkably similar, though in the classical case, we arrived at this result through a fortuitous cancellation of uh, a few different errors. Um, so the Sommerfeld model, uh, in a sense, confirms uh, the Wiedemann-Franz law that we have already derived in the framework of the Druid model. Uh, other things like uh, the AC conductivity uh, and so forth that don't really rely on the specific velocity distribution uh, we use are the same in the Sommerfeld model uh, as, uh, as, as in the Druid model. Um, so, this really completes our discussion of the behavior of free electrons in metals. Um, in the next set of lectures, we'll begin to dismantle the assumption that the electrons are free, that they don't interact with the ions except during collisions. Uh, that discussion will lead us eventually to band structure, which is really one of the main components of the course. Uh, and you'll begin to see how uh, the electron ion interaction uh, leads to very strange uh, and remarkable things that occur in solid state physics.